Welcome to SCOTUScast, a project of the Federalist Society for Law and Public Policy Studies. Our contributors join us from around the country to bring you expert commentary on U.S. Supreme Court cases as they are argued and decisions are issued. The Federalist Society takes no position on particular legal or public policy issues. All expressions of opinion are those of the speaker. Thank you for joining us for this post-decision episode of SCOTUScast. I'm your host, Spencer Karen. On July 8, 2020, the Supreme Court decided Little Sisters of the Poor v. Pennsylvania, upholding in a 7-2 ruling a federal rule exempting employers with religious or moral objections from providing contraceptive coverage to their employees under the Affordable Care Act. To discuss this case and its implications, we have Eric Niffen, partner at Lewis Rocco Rothberger Christie LLP. Today we are going to be talking about the decision released today in Little Sisters of the Poor versus Pennsylvania. So as by way of background, this controversy has been going on since 2011. Uh, part one of the court's decision gives a good view uh, of the backstory. Under the Affordable Care Act, part of the Affordable Care Act was the Women's Health Amendment, which requires coverage of certain preventative care and screenings as determined by HRSA, which is an office within HHS. HRSA subsequently uh, created a list which included um, among the preventative care services that were required, all FDA approved contraceptives. As um, will become significant as we go on here, this list itself did not go through notice and comment. In fact, the contraception mandate itself has never gone through the notice and comment process under the um, Administrative Procedure Act. We'll talk more about this later. So this mandate was created by HRSA And then between 2011 and 2017, the three departments responsible for enforcing the Women's Health Amendment, HHS, Labor, and Treasury, issued rules changing how the mandate would be enforced on 16 different occasions. And a lot of those rules were part of uh, an enormous slate of, of uh, of litigation that went over about the mandate, and so responding to different court rulings. But there was an enormous amount of adjustments of the mandate through this time. So there were dozens of district court cases that were filed against the mandate involving hundreds of religious employers. There were at least 28 cases briefed at the Court of Appeals level with at least 23 written decisions on the mandate. And this uh, saga, um, I think Justice Alito called it an odyssey, has been to the Supreme Court many times, including three written decisions, the Hobby Lobby decision, the Wheaton College decision, and the Zubik decision, and now this one, uh, a fourth. The central issue for much of this time has uh, been as a result of the way the Obama administration approached the religious liberty concerns resulting from this contraception mandate. Uh, Originally, the mandate did not have any provisions for religious employers, but pretty quickly the Obama administration created uh, an exemption for so-called religious employers, but that exemption was very, very narrow based on a tax code provision um, that basically said that the only entities that um, qualified as religious employers were churches, uh, religious orders, and the uh, integrated auxiliaries of churches, a very narrow exemption. And then uh, sort of the next step down, later down the line, the administration created a so-called accommodation for religious exercise. This accommodation uh, was described by the administration and by many courts as an opt-out But many religious employers, including the Little Sisters of the Poor, says this is not really an opt-out because it still requires us to uh, include these contraceptives as part of our health care plan and also requires us to take steps that triggers our third-party administrator's duty to um, deliver those drugs. And so the Little Sisters and others uh, have been in litigation for years saying that the um, the accommodation created by the Obama administration does not um, satisfy our concerns, our moral complicity concerns with the mandate. So this came before the Supreme Court in 2016, um, shortly after Justice Scalia's passing. 
And that seems to have impacted the court's posture there. It could be that the court was split in such a way that uh, the court did not want to issue a merits decision um, being shorthanded at that time. And so in 2016, the court decided to not resolve the underlying issues and told the parties to work it out. The Obama administration made some efforts to try to understand where the parties were on this. And then in the, the very end of the Obama administration, uh, the agency says, we cannot find any satisfying uh, resolution to this. And so they left the rules in place, these same rules um, that the Little Sisters had been litigating against. So then comes the Trump administration, which in 2017 created uh, another set of regulations. I mentioned that there were at least 16 rule changes under the Obama administration. And then the Trump administration added another, creating a much broader religious exemption. And so I said um, earlier that the, the definition of religious employer under the Obama administration was very, very narrow, and the Trump administration made it much broader. Within a week, there were a half dozen lawsuits um, against the, this new rule. So uh, previously, all the lawsuits were brought by religious organizations against the administration, and now these were brought by states and uh, women's advocacy groups against uh, the Trump administration. Two um, of those lawsuits bubbled to the top. There were district court rulings in Pennsylvania and California by district court judges, and then that went on to the Third and Ninth Circuit, which affirmed, and those cases were consolidated before the court. So the issue here is whether the Trump administration acted lawfully when it created this broader religious employer exemption. Uh, the Third Circuit uh, was the lead case before the court, but the Third Circuit's uh, holding had four holdings that uh, Justice Alito points out in his concurrence. First of all, the held that the Little Sisters lacked standing to appeal. Second, that the Affordable Care Act did not permit any exemptions from the HHS mandate. Third, that the departments violated the APA's procedural requirements by issuing this broader religious employer exemption as an IFR. And then fourth, that the departments violated the APA's substantive requirements because uh, the departments did not look at the comments carefully and with an open mind. And the Supreme Court reversed the Third Circuit on all four grounds. So to the court's opinion, the court ruled seven to two. Part one of the court's opinion is the backstory, as we've already um, gone over here briefly. Part two focuses on did the departments have the statutory authority to promulgate the broader religious employer exemption? So this is an Administrative Procedure Act issue. The court said yes. The court said our analysis begins and ends with the text. This is a nod to the textualism that we saw in Justice Gorsuch's opinion in Bostock not long ago. So the court continues on this theme. Uh, the court said that on its face, the Women's Health Amendment granted sweeping authority to HRSA to create the mandate as it saw fit, and uh, also emphasized that Congress did not say that contraception should be covered. So it would have been one thing if Congress had said um, HRSA can work out the details, but one of the things that HRSA must do is uh, say that contraception must be covered. Uh, Congress did not do that. Uh, the, the language of the Women's Health Amendment was broad and did not specify anything like that. And so that added to the discretion that Congress gave HRSA in crafting the mandate. Uh, in fact, in footnote eight of the court's opinion, uh, it noted something that uh, I have emphasized in my own advocacy on this issue, that the mandate itself is only a website and has been changed many times without notice. Uh, so on several occasions, HRSA has gone back to this original um, list of preventative screenings that must be covered for women and uh, has changed those, not big changes, but little ones. And there's been, there's been no um, controversy over that. There was no uh, administrative uh, process that preceded those changes. Uh, uh, and so the contraception mandate is of a piece with all of those, that it could be expanded or it could be eliminated um, altogether just by updating uh, a website put out by HRSA. The bottom line of the court's decision, its majority uh, decision, uh, is on page 18 of the slip opinion. The only question we face today is what the plain language of the statute authorizes. And the plain language of the statute clearly authorizes the departments to create the preventative care standards as well as the religious and moral exemptions. The um, 
there was another part of the court's decision um, talking about RFRA, but this was dicta unnecessary to the court's holding. The Third Circuit had argued that the departments could not take RFRA into account in crafting any sort of regulations about the mandate uh, under RFRA as they craft uh, regulations about the mandate. Part three of the court's decision, uh, the claim that the exemptions were procedurally invalid under the APA. So the court uh, rejected this argument as all uh, as well. The court says no, that the, the department's IFR gave the public fair notice and also rejected the uh, argument that the APA contains an open mind requirement that the, uh, the departments in responding to public comments that they receive um, on a proposed regulation that they have to meet some some sort of vague standard that shows that they were really had an open mind when they listened to those questions. And the court says, no, that's not part of the statute. Again, as in Bostock, we're just going with what the statute says. So the court's conclusion on page 26 of the uh, slip opinion, we hold today that departments had the statutory authority to craft the exemption. And we further hold that the rules promulgating these exemptions are free from procedural defects. So there are big religious liberty themes in this case, but the case itself was decided on Administrative Procedure Act grounds. So that's the court's opinion. Moving on to Justice Alito's concurrence, which was joined by Justice Gorsuch. Justice Alito warns that this will not be the end of this saga because, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the court did not go on to resolve some of the RIFRA and other issues that were opined on by the Third Circuit and that have been part of this saga going back to 2011. And by sidestepping some of those issues, um, there is more, uh, it, it reasons that there will be more to this. Um, Justice Alito says, and then J Justice Kagan and her concurrence agrees that uh, this case will go back down to the Third Circuit for the Third Circuit to decide whether the, um, whether these regulations are arbitrary and capricious under the Affordable Care Act, excuse me, under the Administrative Procedure Act. And so with that in mind, Alito says, uh, Alito goes on to say that he does not believe that the exemptions um, created by the Trump administration are arbitrary and capricious. He says they're required by RFRA, and he explains why. His concurrence is a really good overview and understanding RFRA and walking through the three parts of that law's legal test. He explains, first of all, that the accommodation challenged by the Little Sisters does substantially burden the religious exercise. Number two, he argues that the contraception mandate does not advance a compelling governmental interest. And third, that it does not advance the government's interest through the least restrictive means, repeating um, some language that the court had um, put out in um, Hobby Lobby, most importantly, which said that the least restrictive means of the government advancing this argument would be, uh, this interest rather, would be for the government to provide contraception coverage directly itself instead of trying to use the plans of religious employers in order to make that coverage available. So that's Justice Alito and Justice Gorsuch's concurrence. Justice Kagan's concurrence, which was joined by Justice Breyer, uh, explores her concern that the religious exemption is arbitrary and capricious, and she offers some reasons that um, I anticipate will be taken up by the Third Circuit uh, in the briefing there and probably in the court's decision that will come subsequent to the Supreme Court's uh, remand here. Last, the final opinion is Justice Ginsburg's dissent. Uh, Justice Ginsburg's dissent focuses largely on a theme she repeated three times at oral argument that the departments have thrown to the winds entirely Congress's instructions that women need and shall have seamless, no cost access to contraceptives. So this is really a battle about what Congress's intent was. It's an issue that you see in the court's opinion and then also in Justice Alito's concurrence and then in Justice uh, Ginsburg's dissent, um, a lot of battle about what the statute requires and what Congress's intent was. So what happens next year in the court's opinion or in this, in this saga more broadly? Has this decision finally ended the legal controversy about the contraception mandate? Uh, unfortunately, I think the answer is no. As I've mentioned, two of the opinions um, explicitly anticipate that the Third Circuit will be looking at whether the Trump administration's exemptions were um, arbitrary and capricious under the Administrative Procedure Act. 
And then even beyond that, uh, regulations of one administrations are rather fragile. And so should there be a, a new president uh, next January, uh, I would anticipate that uh, the Trump administration's broader religious employer exemption would vanish pretty quickly. And so uh, I imagine that one way or another, this is not the end of um, the court's and, and the court's consideration of this issue, I think it's, it's, there's a good chance this will come back up, um, and that for religious employers, this concern about um, whether uh, they will have to provide contraceptive coverage uh, in violation of their religious convictions will still be an ongoing concern. Thank you for listening to this episode of SCOTUS Cast. SCOTUS Cast is a project of the Federalist Society, a not for profit educational organization of conservative and libertarian law students, law professors, and lawyers, founded upon the principles that the state exists to preserve freedom, that the separation of governmental powers is central to our Constitution, and that it is emphatically the province and duty of the judiciary to say what the law is, not what it should be. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast series, including SCOTUScast and Practice Group Podcasts, on iTunes or Google Play. For an archive of past podcasts, as well as audio and video of past Federalist Society events, please visit our website at fedsoc.org slash multimedia. That's F-E-D-S-O-C dot org slash multimedia. This has been a FedSoc audio production.